Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here again, episode 132 of the China History Podcast. Today we're going to begin a series of episodes that takes a more close-up look at some of the nitty-gritty of what went on in the imperial court and about the daily life of an emperor. By zooming in real close and examining the northern Song Huizong Emperor, we can use his life as our vehicle to try and get a better understanding of what a Chinese emperor actually did. Through Huizong, this will also be a chance for us to take a long, hard look at the northern Song dynasty and review some info in more detail from past episodes. We'll touch on episodes CHP 28 on the northern Song as well as CHP 71 on Ouyang Xiao. As a casual student of Chinese history, there was something about the Huizong Emperor that always intrigued me. To have been born so high and to have lived the privileged life that he did for so long, and then to fall so low and endure a most degrading and uncomfortable fate, living out his last years in such humiliating and desperate conditions. When I look at world history and consider the many fates of conquered monarchs, the Emperor Huizong's fate ranks right up there as one of the worst. It wasn't a gruesome fate, not in the Louis XVI, Nicholas II, or Charles I category, but it, was, but it was pretty miserable all the same. That, for some reason, was something that defined this emperor to me more than what he's also known for, that is, his achievement as a patron of the arts, and his personal achievements as a painter, poet, and calligrapher. So when I saw that Dr. Patricia Buckley Ebry at the University of Washington recently published a book called Emperor Huizong, I bought it immediately and put it in the queue for future podcast fodder. It is a nice, big, thick, juicy tome, weighing in at 515 pages plus another 133 pages of notes, references, and appendices. I took one look at this book, and I knew there was a whole multi-part series of podcasts just waiting to see the light of day. And today we're going to get to it. Up till now, and may I also say by popular demand, we haven't gone into that much detail about any of the reigns of any emperor. We talked big picture issues, but never scratched too deep below the surface. So I'd like to take this opportunity to use Dr. Ebry's latest work as a primary source and look at the life of this northern Song Dynasty emperor. And from this look at Huizong's life, we can perhaps get a better understanding of what life was like at the top in that day. The good thing about today's topic is that by the time of the Song Dynasty, they really knew how to keep records. A lot of stuff survives from all kinds of sources. The Song Dynasty was founded by Zhao Kuang Yin in 960, even though that was 1,054 years ago. Somehow quite a bit of material has survived to our present day to give us a pretty good look at almost every aspect of the Song Dynasty. In fact, according to uh, Endymion Wilkinson's China History New Manual, more works survive from the Song from both official and private sources, than from any previous dynasty. The reason is that, unlike the Han, the Jin, Sui, and Tang, it's during the Song that block printing goes mass market. And there occurs a spike in the amount of printed materials that gets out there. I said in that Ouyang Xiao episode that under the Song, China had its Gutenberg moment. And from these Song materials, China scholars over the centuries from all over the world have collectively raised overall understanding of the Song dynasty to a degree where we actually know a heck of a lot about what life was like then. As far as court-related documents and histories, I hate to use the P word, but there indeed were a plethora of documents that survive and give us all the minutia that scholars ever wanted to know about how the machine of state operated. So let's get our bearings on where the Huizong Emperor fits in the bigger Song Dynasty picture. The Song Dynasty ran from 960 to 1279, 319 years. 167 years with the main capital in the north 
at Kaifeng, and then for 149 years down in Lin'an near Hangzhou in the south. The northern Song, the southern Song. As you all remember from past episodes, the northern Song were kicked out of Kaifeng by the Jurchens, and the southern Song are later swept away by the invading Mongols led by Kublai Khan, who ushers in the Yuan dynasty. So let's quickly review everything that led up to the time of Huizong. Now, not including the last northern Song emperor, Huizong's eldest son, who was thrust onto the throne at the last minute as the titanic ship of state was slipping beneath the waves. There were seven emperors who reigned during the northern Song, all surnamed Zhao, like the founder, Zhao Kuangyin, also known as the Song Emperor Taizu. The emperorship went from Taizu to his brother Taizong, then to his son, Zhenzong, followed by his son, Renzong, who, like the Song founder, died without sons. So the emperorship was passed to an adopted son who became the Yingzong Emperor. Now we're getting close to our time period today. The Yingzong Emperor had a son, the Shenzong Emperor, the sixth Song Emperor. Shenzong is pretty important to our story because a lot of stuff happened under the Shenzong Emperor's watch. The Shenzong Emperor had many sons, but the two we care about are his oldest son, who succeeded him as the Zhezong Emperor, and then we come to the subject of today's episode, the Zhezong Emperor's younger brother from a different mother, the Huizong Emperor. So let's back up to the Shenzong Emperor. He reigned from 1068 to 1084. This was the time of William I, a.k.a. William the Conqueror. The First Crusade will begin during Shenzong's son, uh, the Zhezong Emperor's time. Gunpowder had just been invented and was described for the first time in the Wu Jing Yao in 1044. Song society was the most vibrant China had ever seen before. People were on the go and there was a lot of migration of northern elites and literati to the south. So this is the setting. The big achievement or big disaster, depending on your politics, were the new reforms of Wang Anshi. The Shenzong emperor invited Wang into his government and gave him carte blanche to institute the widest range of reforms pretty much ever in Chinese history. Everyone in China was affected by these reforms. Wang Anshi was a progressive liberal inspired by an earlier vice chancellor, Fan Chong Yen, who proposed that it was a good idea to take care of the poor and middle class and help them to rise up. And this will in turn rise up the whole nation by making it stronger and most importantly, providing a regular flow of increased tax revenue into the Song treasury. That was the basic idea in theory. I'm sure you've heard that one before. But Wang Anshir's reforms went far beyond providing for the welfare of the peasantry. They had a massive impact on the military, the bureaucracy, commerce, finance, agriculture, and how society itself was to be organized as well. These reforms of 1068 to 1085 turned the established order on its head, and the Shenzong Emperor backed Wang Anshir and allowed everything to proceed. As long as Wang Anshi had the emperor's backing, it was like a it was like a supermajority in the House and the Senate here in the States. Nobody could do anything about it. But nothing lasts forever in politics, and Wang Anshi had his comeuppance when his primary foes in the government, one-time reformer and now conservative Ouyang Xiao and uh, Su Dongpo, were able to stop Wang in his tracks. And then as soon as the Shenzong Emperor died at the young age of 36, that's it for Wang Anshi, and he's out. The rich and the landed gentry can at last breathe a sigh of relief. There was a new sheriff in town, and whatever they couldn't repeal of the new reforms, they severely diluted. So pretty much from this point, around the time of the Shenzong Emperor, there was some intense bad blood flowing between these reformers and conservatives. And this pretty much was the state of affairs when Hui Zong became emperor. Song founder Zhao Kuangyin had already been dead for 92 years. So this Shenzong emperor, as I said, he died unexpectedly and before his time. Hui Zong was only 28 months old. His older brother had been made the official heir 
only four days before Shen Zong's death. So you know he held out to the last minute to name his successor. This new emperor, Zhezong, he was only nine when fate thrust this burden on him. As it always goes in cases like this, someone ruled on behalf of the emperor while he was in his minority. In the case of the Zhezong emperor, it was his grandmother, the mother of the deceased Shenzong emperor and the empress to the Yingzong emperor. This was Empress Dowager Gao, and she wasted no time dismantling pretty much all the reforms of Wang Anshi and bringing back the conservative heavyweights Sima Guang and Su Shi, a.k.a. Su Dongpo, who I mentioned, the man who also gave us the Hangzhou specialty dish, Dongpo Ro. So when Hui Zong was just a toddler wearing imperial split pants, all these reform-minded ministers were all being shown the door. Hui Zong would have spent his first five years living in the women's section of the palace. The imperial palace was all divided up into sections, and all the female royals all had their area. This is where Hui Zong spent all his time. The two top heavyweights at the time were Empress Dowager Xiang, and Grand Empress Dowager Gao. Xiang being Hui Zong's legal mother, but not his birth mother. And Gao, as I said, the grandmother of Hui Zong and Zhe Zong emperors. But the way the pecking order worked, Empress Dowager Xiang's word counted the most. You had one empress and a whole lot of consorts. The way to get ahead in the household was to bear sons for the top guy. That's how consorts improve their lot in the grand scheme of palace politics. Huizong was the son of one of Shenzong's consorts named Chun, and consort Chun's share price naturally skyrocketed as soon as she produced a son. By the time Huizong was a 12-year-old prince, he received a new title that came with a nice fiefdom of 3,000 households, one-third of which provided him with tax income. In his day, as in ours, the rich always got richer. More titles and entitlements came Hui Zong's way, and to say he lived a nice, easy, privileged life was an understatement. You see, the Song Dynasty way of doing things was the princes, the brothers of the emperor, they weren't given any role to play in the politics of the court. They all got their villas, staff, annual budget, and whatever else they might need, and they stayed out of court politics, the military, and remained as benign as can be, so as to pose no possible threat one day to the emperor, their brother. In 1092, when Hui Zong was 10, the event of the year was the marriage of his 15-and-a-half-year-old brother, the Zhe Zong Emperor. This was quite a big deal, and the capital in Kaifeng hadn't seen a royal wedding in seven decades. This gala event was followed a year later by the unfortunate death of Grand Empress Dowager Go. If you haven't noticed, I'm referring to all emperors by their temple names. These are all the names that would have been given to them posthumously. The one thing all these emperors and princes had in common was that they were all to the last man surnamed Zhao. Shenzong was Zhao Xu, Zhe Zong was also Zhao Xu, but a different character, Xu. And Hui Zong, he was Zhao Ji. But whenever discussing time periods in imperial Chinese history, pretty much everyone refers to the emperor by his temple name. So Hui Zong lived it up as a young Song prince. He had been schooled by palace tutors up until around the age of 10, but now he was being taught by outside teachers and experts. Back in those days, it was hardcore, rote memorization of the classics. Occasionally, Hui Zong would get to wander around Kaifeng with an entourage, of course, but he did get to see it. The Jews of Kaifeng didn't have their temple yet. That would come in 1163, uh, 28 years after Hui Zong's death. But it's possible that the Hui Zong emperor might have spotted one of them walking around. When the Hui Zong emperor got out of the palace or out of his villa and got to see the city, Kaifeng was, at that time, the greatest city in the world. In the late 11th century, there was no place like it on earth. The walled city of Kaifeng was massive. It had a moat and everything. 300,000 soldiers guarded it. The core was the old city, which measured three kilometers per each of the four sides. 
because of the explosive population growth in the mid-10th century, new walls were built that enveloped the old city walls. These new walls were seven kilometers long on each side and 12 meters high, almost 40 feet. Magnificent Tang Palace, the wonder of the world in its day, located in Chang'an, present-day Xi'an. Those walls were slightly longer, measuring nine kilometers per side. The Chang'an Palace was 84 square kilometers versus 49 square kilometers for the palace in Kaifeng, where the northern Song emperors hung their hat. Inside the palace, the counselors handled matters of state, and eunuchs or palace ladies attended to the personal matters of the royals. Life was completely segregated between men and women. Princesses were all married out of the palace by the time they were 16, as far as Nobility goes. In the Song Dynasty, you had the Zhaos, and that's it. No Marlboros, Fujiwaras, or other big hereditary nobles. You had the Zhao Imperial Clan, and no one else. There were 21 gates that led you in and out of the city. A moat surrounded the walled city, 30 meters wide and 5 meters deep. The population of Kaifeng during the time of Huizong was about 1.2 million inhabitants, same as during the height of the Tang Dynasty. But Kaifeng's scale was a little smaller than Chang'an. The Bien River crossed west to east through Kaifeng, and it eventually linked up with the Grand Canal from which one could sail south to Hangzhou. There were four capitals of the northern Song, but the imperial family always stayed in the eastern capital of Kaifeng and didn't move around much like emperors from past dynasties. When the emperor left the palace and ventured out of the palace for some ritual or another, that was the, that was the only chance one ever got to see him. If you lived outside of Kaifeng, forget it. These guys were not like the Qianlong emperor who loved to travel around the Middle Kingdom. The palace was inside the walled city, and the place to hang out back in those days, and I guess in Chang'an as well during the Tang, was right outside the palace gates. That was where everyone assembled and met up. And wherever people assembled in masses, you also had street vendors, entertainers, beggars, theaters, places to engage in the sins of the day. There were, there were night markets, dumpling and noodle joints, tea houses, restaurants, you name it. Everything but an internet cafe. And Huizong, on rare occasions, would get to dress up in his princely finery and ride his horse around Kaifeng, always surrounded by his palace guards, and, you know, would check out the scene. By 1098, when Huizong was 16, he and four other princes, all sons of Shenzong, left the luxury and comfort of the palace and moved into the luxury and comfort of their new digs. These new princely villas were designed by no less a person than Li Jie himself. Li Jie was to architecture who, say, Sun Tzu was to military strategy. He is traditionally called China's greatest architect from ancient times. Li Jie wrote a book called the Ying Zao Fa Shi, or the Treatise on Architectural Methods. This was completed under the reign of the Zhezong Emperor, but it wasn't published and widely distributed until the time of the Huizong Emperor's reign. Li Jie not only went back and compiled all the important info from previous works, he improved on them and added more. It's an entire how-to-do technical handbook on everything that needed to be known back then about building structures, craftsmanship, tools, and materials. And one of the things that makes Li Jie's Ying Zao Fa Shi special is that it was discovered in its entirety, and everything he wrote, we got it. This was a technical guide that aided architects, builders, and craftsmen for centuries. And this is who the Zhezong Emperor commissioned to design and build the villas for all the princes, including Hui Zong. Hui Zong, now called the Prince of Duan, Duan Wang would later make Li Jie his chief architect and director of palace buildings. Hui Zong didn't have much to do except enjoy the pleasures of a young teen aristocrat. Occasionally, he would be called in to cover at some ritual for his brother, the Zhezong Emperor. The deceased Emperor Shenzong's sister had a husband named Wang Shen. 
He was quite the artist and an enthusiastic collector of art. In fact, there are paintings by Wang Shun that survive to this day. Go to Taipei to the National Palace Museum. You could see him. Wang Shun taught Hui Zong everything about this world of poetry, painting, calligraphy, and collecting. I mean, back in those days when the literati, royal or non-royal, got together to drink tea, wine, or whatever, most of their discourse revolved around these things. In 1099, when Hui Zong turned 17, he was married off to a nice... 16-year-old bride, hand-selected by the highest authorities in the palace. And as a wedding present, the Empress Dowager Xiang gave her legal son two concubines. So it was a happy-go-lucky time for this young prince. Not a care in the world, and certainly none of the problems of his older brother, the 21-year-old Zhezong Emperor. He was not doing well at all. Aside from the pressures of being a young and untested monarch in shark-infested palace waters, he was not in robust health. In fact, you could say he was dying. Up until maybe the 18th or 19th century, if you got sick, some of the cures used in the day would, would often kill you. I'm not saying this is what happened in the case of the young Zhezong emperor, but he went pretty quick. Around the time of Hui Zong's wedding the emperor began to complain of this persistent cough that he just couldn't get rid of and a dose of constipation. Despite all the treatments available to the Son of Heaven, things got worse, and everyone who came in contact with the emperor saw he was visibly not well. The state of the art in medicine during the Song Dynasty may have been the best in the world, but it probably wasn't all that great from our perspective today. So the Zhezong Emperor, at such a young age, was uh, starting to lose his life force. In his 14 years as Emperor, Zhezong, with his consorts, had produced a total of four girls. Then suddenly, when all was looking so bad, one of his consorts, surnamed Liu, produced a son, and there was rejoicing throughout the halls of the imperial city at such good fortune. Consort Liu, for her fine role, was made an empress, and the Zhezong emperor suddenly began to rally and make a comeback. But at the height of all this celebration, this son and heir died, and to make matters worse, the emperor's two-year-old daughter died suddenly afterwards. And then that's it. By 1100, the Zhezong emperor had slipped back into poor health, and the powers that be all put their heads together and started thinking about what to do next. As I said, medicine back then was hardly what it is today, so lacking any herbal remedy, one of the proposed cures was to offer a general amnesty. The precedent for this great idea came from the Renzong Emperor, who, when quite ill, offered up an amnesty and then miraculously recovered. They also carried out Buddhist and Taoist ritual services for a seven-day period and treated the emperor with moxibustion. This form of Chinese medicine used the charred roots of the mugwort plant, Artemisia vulgaris. Moxibustion is, is thousands of years old and was practiced in China, Korea, and Japan. The main idea behind this was that this process would strengthen the blood and stimulate the flow of qi and maintain general health. Even traditional Chinese medicine today uses this method to treat illnesses. Whatever the case may be, all the mugwort roots in the world couldn't help the Zhezong Emperor, and he died on January 11th, 1100. Now what, right? The Song rulers up till now hadn't had the best luck with imperial succession. For some reason, the survival rate of sons in the palace was real low, and there was a history of mental and physical health issues. So from Taizu to Taizong, to Zhenzong, to Renzong, to Yingzong, to Shenzong, to the present, now deceased Zhezong Emperor, it wasn't always smooth sailing. You remember the Zhezong Emperor? He only got the call to be heir a few days before his father, the Shenzong Emperor, died. Everyone at the top echelon of power put in their two cents about, you know, who should succeed Zhezong, but it was the Empress Dowager Xiang who had the final say. When other princes were proffered as the best choice, Empress Dowager Xiang's conclusion was, quote, 
All of them, from the Prince of Shun on down, are equally Shenzong's sons. It would be difficult to distinguish among them on the basis of parentage. The Prince of Shun has sick eyes. The next is Prince Duan, so he should succeed. Moreover, the late emperor once said that the Prince of Duan would have a long and prosperous life. The Prince of Shun she was talking about was Hui Zong's older brother, Bi. Being older, though just barely, he was the logical next choice to succeed Zhe Zong. But in those words from Empress Dowager Xiang, Hui Zong's fate was sealed. I'm not sure exactly what was wrong with the eyes of the Prince of Shun. He could have been blind, cross-eyed, or something like that, or maybe he just had poor vision. Whatever the case may be, the Empress Dowager didn't like him, and so he got shunted aside. The fact that Hui Zong's birth mother had died was also appealing to the Empress Dowager. With Hui Zong on the throne, there would be one less competitor at court. It was written by one of the counselors present that day, quote, when we got to the chamber with the curtain of state, the Empress Dowager, seated behind the curtain, said to the prince, quote, The Emperor has abandoned the world and has no son. You, the Prince of Duan, should succeed. The prince, shaking, strongly declined, saying, The Prince of Shun, meaning his older brother B, is the oldest. I dare not accept. The Empress Dowager said, The Prince of Shun has defective eyes. The next should be established. You should not decline. I also said that for the sake of the dynasty, he should not refuse. The manager and others pulled up the screen curtain and took the Prince of Duan behind it. He was still strongly protesting. The Empress Dowager told him to stop. I also parted the curtains and said, For the sake of the country, you should not decline. From behind the screen, we heard the eunuch managers and others transmitting the message to take the hat. Then we left and stood below in the courtyard for a while. When the curtain was rolled up, the emperor was wearing a hat and a yellow jacket, sitting on the throne. The counselors and the eunuchs from the manager on down all lined up. After congratulating Hui Zong, the wailing for Zhe Zong began. There is someone playing a role in the transition from Zhe Zong to Hui Zong. He hasn't a major role yet, but he's already involved in the rituals and ceremonies dealing with the death of Zhe Zong. This is Cai Jing. He's a famous villain from Chinese history, and we'll be getting to him as his role increases in Hui Zong's administration. His corruption and political machinations aside, he was one of the greatest calligraphers of his day, and there were some real heavy hitters wielding a brush in Song China in the 11th and 12th centuries. Tsai Jing's brother was one of the top officials at court. This was Tsai Bian. More of him later. So Hui Zong's life takes an unexpected turn. Had the emperorship gone to his older brother, life would have gone on in its idyllic and pleasant way. No major responsibilities, no hand in the nasty court politics, just a nice, big stipend, a beautiful pad, and sitting around enjoying the gentlemanly pursuits of the day. But the record states pretty clearly that it was his adoptive mother, Empress Dowager Xiang, who wanted him on the throne, and so it was. Well, he still ended up with a nice place to live and still had uh, plenty of time on his hands to deal with his artistic and literary passions. But now he had to dive headfirst into the world of court politics. And as I said, since the time of Wang Anshi during the reign of Hui Zong's father, Shen Zong, Court politics was not for the squeamish. The two main opposing factions really had the knives out for each other. And now, with a new emperor, this presented a rare chance for one faction to gain the advantage over the other. That Hui Zong was so young and untested made for an interesting dynamic. The cushions on the imperial throne weren't even warm yet before Hui Zong requested that the Empress Dowager Xiang act as his advisor. She couldn't be a regent because he was already too old to have one of those. He was an adult, according to the custom, and in his majority. But all the same, he asked that the Empress Dowager stand with him for a while. And she reluctantly agreed. She was not looking to get herself too deeply involved in all the BS that went on in the palace court. This Empress Dowager was no Tsushi. I hate to say this, but I'm going to have to dump a lot of names on you right now. 
This is the this is the setup for the reign of Hui Zong. The main characters will be the chief counselors, uh, eunuchs, and fellow royals. There were four brothers of Hui Zong. We mentioned the Prince of Shun. His name was Bi. There were also three others, Wu, Si, and Si. The four council members when Hui Zong took over were Zheng Bu, Zhang Dun, Cai Bian, who I mentioned, and Xu Jiang. These guys were all reformers, but that didn't mean they didn't fight amongst themselves constantly. The top eunuch at the time was Liang Chongzheng. The way it worked, you know, probably with most Chinese emperors, was that they held supposed ultimate authority. But each and every counselor or eunuch who had access to the emperor would, at every opportune moment, put on a full court press to use every ounce of their influence to bend the will of the emperor in a certain direction. And any bureaucracy worth their salt had a thousand tricks up their sleeves that allowed them to not carry out what the emperor was calling for. The emperor relied on these guys and they all had private agendas and an axe to grind with someone or other near the top. These officials, big and small, who worked in Kaifeng, they were the elites. To serve anywhere else except Kaifeng was like, was like being banished. There were 300 or so prefectures in Song, China. To serve in any one of them was to operate in a political Siberia. All the action took place in Kaifeng, and all the action in Kaifeng took place in the Imperial Palace. The two political arenas of the day where everything was decided were the Imperial Audience Hall, where all the big, major, macro-level decisions were made. Pronouncements made in the Audience Hall had maximum gravitas. There were also these literati opinion circles. These were the lucky few who had regular access to the emperor informally. Well, there there was never anything informal when the emperor was around, but... These were the gang who would hang out, discuss poetry, share calligraphy, and, you know, do all those things the literary and artsy-fartsy types do when they get together. They would be in these situations, and this would create a forum for these officials to lobby Hui Zong and test the waters. When decisions got made, they were printed into a kind of official gazette that was passed around the capital. And from there, word spread through the realm, through the internet of the day. Word of mouth. The first order of business, after all the morning rituals and ceremonies and the correct amount of time had passed, was to bury the Zhezong Emperor. His tomb was located where all the other Song Emperor tombs were, in Gong County. That's the today's city of Gongyi, which is located about equidistantly between Luoyang and Zhengzhou. Hui Zong began to bring back the reformers who had not fared well under his conservative-leaning brother, the Zhezong Emperor. And as soon as these reformers got back to the palace, of course, they at once began to try and dismantle everything the conservatives had just built. But Hui Zong also brought back anti-reformers as well, like Han Zhongyan and several others. Amidst Hui Zong's redesign of the palace government and all the bickering going on behind the scenes, there was bound to be some sort of shake-up. Hui Zong did his best to build a team and to encourage openness. By the seventh month of his reign, the Empress Dowager Xiang resigned and said she was no longer needed. Actually, all she had done up till now was simply agree with whatever the counselors and the emperor already decided. She really didn't want to stay on, as Hui Zong requested when he ascended the throne. She didn't stay that engaged in policymaking, and as soon as things appeared in order, she stepped down. The senior grand counselor now was Han Zhongyan. His junior as grand counselor was Zheng Bu. They obviously had the greatest power and influence where Hui Zong was concerned. Now, don't mix Han Zhongyan with Fan Zhongyan, the reformer who inspired uh, Wang Anshi. By the time Hui Zong finished up his first year on the throne, he had reason to be hopeful. The succession was smooth and without any great opposition. He had quickly gained the support of the conservative faction by bringing so many of them back. He seemed as if he was going to be an emperor who got involved and he encouraged his officials to speak up. He performed his role 
admirably in a thousand and one rituals requiring his presence or involvement. Though it was far from a perfect team, he did manage to put together a competent group of officials early on. Tsung Bu was sort of adopted early on as Hui Zong's teacher. He was trusted and was closest to Tsung Bu and listened to his advice. And of course, Hui Zong still found time for the arts. Other than his depressing demise later on in life, it's art and literature that the Song Hui Zong Emperor is remembered for. Some more good fortune. Real early on in the game, Hui Zong's empress gave birth to a boy, and one of his consorts, a wedding gift from his adopted mother, gave birth to a girl. Things were off to an auspicious start. The first year hadn't gone too badly. Hui Zong got very close to one of the more famous Taoist priests of the day, Liu Hun Kang. Liu had used his Taoist ways to cure the Zhezong Emperor's mother, Empress Dowager Gao. His prestige soared after that, and he was bestowed with all kinds of honors. He had a lot of face time with the Emperor Hui Zong, and the two exchanged letters and poems often. Later on, we'll see Hui Zong really goes overboard with his enthusiasm for uh, Taoist beliefs, and Liu Hun Kang was, was an early influence. This uh, might be as good a place as any to put the bookmark in the end of the first year. Hui Zong reigned for 26 years, and I promise you, we'll pick up the pace a little. This won't be one episode per year. But let's just get comfortable and stay a while in the late northern Song of the 3,689 years of Chinese history, going back to the first emperor of the Shang dynasty. These days of the northern Song were some of China's finest. As I mentioned in previous podcasts, China, despite being surrounded by powerful, aggressive, and dangerous enemies, was on a roll in the late 11th and early 12th centuries. So we're going to keep going with the Hui Zong Emperor for a while. We'll just sort of use him as our window into these times in China. Once again, Patricia Buckley Ebri. The book is Emperor Hui Zong, published by Harvard University Press. Great book to get lost in, and I'll be using this as one of my primary sources for this series, so I do hope you'll enjoy this. Some uh, amateur and professional China scholars might know of uh, Professor Ebri's book, The Cambridge Illustrated History of China. I have the second edition that came out in 2010. It covers China from Neolithic times to Gaike Kaifeng. So anyone looking for a nice, easy-to-read general history of China, this one is quite good, and I always recommend it. Hey, I'm coming to Shanghai and Hangzhou sometime in mid-April. Maybe a few days in Shanghai and a week or so in Hangzhou. A lot of you have written to me about hooking up next time I'm in town. And in true fashion, I started to keep a list of everyone to call. Then I stopped keeping the list, and now I can't find it anywhere. So, so let me know, my cherished listeners, if anyone wants to meet up for a beer and an egg roll. A lot of you previously reached out to me. I'm going to Hangzhou to study tea and work with one of the local experts there for this series I've been talking about doing for the longest time on the history of tea and Chinese tea culture. So I'm finally going to do something other than talk about it. Um, They're not my sponsor or anything, but if you like books about Asia in general or China in particular, check out all the titles available at Tuttle Publishing. That's TuttlePublishing.com. They got, they got some great stuff. They, they just published a new book on Sir Robert Hart, who we featured in episode CHP 58. It's called An Irishman in China. The author is Zhao Changtian, who sadly passed away last year. So check those guys out at Tuttle, T-U-T-T-L-E. I used to go to all the book shows in London, Frankfurt, and New York, and would always love to go to their booth and check out their stuff. They had some Great coffee table books on Asia. Uh, next time, more Hui Zong. I have that Washington, D.C. trip, March 24 to 29. So part two of this series might be coming a little later than usual. Whatever usual is these days. That's it, everyone. This is your humble narrator, Laszlo Montgomery, signing off from Claremont, California. It's Asia blue skies here again, even with all the L.A. smog. 88 degrees as we speak, if you could believe that. Take care, all, and please do consider coming back next time, and the time after that, for another exciting episode 
of the China History Podcast.